Yeah, yeah. So the subject of my talk will be graphemic and graphetic methods. So it's, it will be quite short. I have only three parts and uh, some references. And uh, as I am fundamentally a computer scientist or mathematician, I like to build models. Uh, and I like also to give definitions. So uh, let us start with some definitions so that we know what we are talking about. So this is not to teach you anything, but uh, just to be sure we have the same understanding of terminology. So in the title, graphemic and graphetic methods for gender neutral writing, when I say graphemic, I'm referring to graphemes. Graphemes can be defined in several ways. Um, the one I like the most is the autonomistic approach where grapheme is defined in the same way as a phoneme as an elementary distinctive unit in a system. And this system is the written modality of a language. And then there is also the so-called phonographic approach where we start with phonemes and we look at graphemes that represent phonemes. So we study uh, the um, relation between phonemes and graphemes and we define graphemes as the strings representing phonemes. So this works only when we have already studied the phonemics of a language while the first definition is independent of uh, whatever uh, phonetic. Uh, so graphemes are abstract units, distinctive units describing a system, and graphs are the material side of graphemes. So how are uh, graphemes represented in visual form? So visual form can be on several different uh, uh, substrates like um, the screen or paper or whatever, or even braille and so on. And the third term, gender neutrality. Uh, I'm not going to speak about the social and sociolinguistic aspects of gender neutrality. Uh, in this talk, uh, gender neutrality is just a series of methods applied to languages. So this is really the basic level. And the goal is to avoid being gender specific or in some cases to hide gender. And of course there are different kinds of methods. What I call graphemic methods are those uh, using graphemes and uh, these are very often hard to represent phonetically by definition. And then we have morphological methods. So for example, if you take the generis femininum, then you use the suffix of the female form for all genders. They can be lexical, choose a word which is neutral. They can be syntactic. So if we give both the feminine and the masculine and so on. And I will cover only graphemic and graph graphetic uh, methods. And uh, Kotthoff and Nübling is an excellent uh, reference for other kinds of graphemic methods. My model is uh, the one of a gender neutral form. So a form is the result of a transformation which starts with two form of a word, so uh, same semantics, but different gender, uh, ma masculine form and feminine form. And it results into a single form, which depending on what we want to achieve, will encompass, include, hide, and so on. And here I'm giving you some examples, which you will see over and over in this talk. In German, the binum e. In French, écriture inclusive. In Italian, linguaggio inclusivo. Uh, this is not Russian, but Bielorussian. We will see more details. 
and also in Greek. And you see that every time we have two forms and the resulting form um, uh, takes information from both sides. And uh, sometimes these forms uh, are also meant to represent non-binary genders. And then we have many, many different cases which uh, are meant to be included in the semantics of these forms. How does this transformation look like? So in fact, there is one thing which is asymmetric. It's the fact that from these two forms, W masculine, W feminine, I'm taking a common prefix, which corresponds to the feminine version. So I uh, should be aware, uh, conscious of the fact that this is not symmetric. It's the feminine version. So for example, Arzt, you have this prefix, Ärztin, same prefix work with the umlaut, and we will choose the feminine one. Same thing also in uh, Belarusian and um, in other languages, it's um, often the same. Now, the result of this transformation will be this stem, so the prefix, plus the transformation applied to the masculine suffix. So if W masculine is the stem plus the suffix, then here we transform the suffix of the masculine version and then we transform the suffix of the feminine version. And plus is concatenation. So in the first case, I'm calling this a male prepositive form because I'm using the male information first. But there exist also female prepositive forms where we take first the feminine one and then the masculine. But these are more seldom. Now, I'm, I will count something which is very important and which I call backtrack, which is the length of the transformation of the masculine suffix. So for example, uh, here, uh, the masculine suffix, there is no masculine suffix, it's void. So the backtrack is zero. But in a word such as kollege, Kollegin, you have to remove the E from kollege in order to place the feminine suffix, kollegin. So the backtrack in that case is one. Here in Mathites, uh, you have to remove two letters, S, to put Ries. But in fact, because uh, in this case, the method is uh, syllabic, we go back up to letter to, and then use the feminine suffix. So we get matites, matitres. So here the backtrack is of three. Now, why is this an important uh, characteristic of this method? Because the higher the backtrack, the higher the cognitive load. To read, you have to go back. Here, go three letters back, and then replace the feminine suff suffix uh, uh, at that location. So the more you have to go back, the more difficult it is to read, and the more the gender neutral form is difficult to apprehend. So here are examples and uh, the five columns give the uh, elements of my model. So here you have the common prefix. This is the masculine suffix. Uh, I took the genitive form, the genitive case. Uh, so it disappears and the feminine form changes not graphemically, but graphetically since the 
first letter is marked by being uppercase. In the French case, there is no uh, masculine suffix. The feminine suffix is preceded by a punctuation character, a punctuation mark, which is called the median point. And so this is the transformed feminine suffix. In Italian, the masculine suffix disappears and the feminine suffix is replaced by something which I will call the uh, substitution graphene. In this case, it is punctuation and so on. Now, from this table, I deduce that we have three different methods. The first one, subst, is substitution of a single grapheme by a generic grapheme, which has to be the same uh, for all words of the language, which I will denote by SG, substitution grapheme. So for example, here, ragazzo, the O is substituted, is replaced by SG. The second one I call mark because as in German, the masculine suffix disappears and the feminine suffix, the first letter of the feminine suffix, the boundary of the feminine suffix is marked by an uppercase. So this mark can be graphetic or it can also be insertion of a punctuation grapheme like in Belarusian, where we have the same method like in German, but not with a graphetic difference, but with a graphemic insertion. And the third method is join. So in substitution, we substitute. In mark, we omit the masculine suffix and use the feminine one. And in join, we use both masculine and feminine. And we join them by a generic, so once again, generic for a given language, join a grapheme, which I will denote by GJ. And here is my classification of graphemic gender neutral methods, graphemic and graphetic. So substitution can be vocally consonantal or punctuational depending on the substitution grapheme. If it's vocalic and co or consonantal, then it has a phonemic value. So I'm, uh, the choice of the grapheme is important. If it's punctuational, then I consider that there is a single grapheme, the function of it, which is to be the um, substitution grapheme. And it doesn't matter what graph is used for that grapheme. It can be an art sign, it can be an asterisk. Uh, you can choose any punctuation mark, uh, not, maybe not any arbitrary, but um, you have a choice uh, and uh, this choice doesn't matter very much. Then second method mark can be graphetic or graphemic. Graphetic is uh, when you keep the same graphemes, but mark them in some way. And graphemic, if you add a grapheme at uh, the boundary between the stem and the feminine suffix. And join can be graphemic, phonographemic or syllabic, depending on where you will break your work between stem and suffix. So what will be the backdrop? And we will see that uh, in the case of uh, French, it's actually phonographic. Now, another notion which is important in this model is the one of privileging. So I will call a method either male privileging or female privileging if the form we obtain, the gender, gender neutral, neutral form, is perceptually closer to either male or female. Or if inside the gender neutral form, we can see 
either the masculine or the feminine part. And this part is more salient. So for example, the German binnen E method is female privilege. Because when you see this word, what is salient is the feminine form. It looks like studentin, and the only difference is um, a capital E inside the word. And uh, Kotthoff is stating that being the feminine concurrence with a feminine bewusst privilegium. And this is especially true uh, when the graphs used are narrow sunset, like here. On the other hand, the French join method can be female privileging, like here, where the backtrack is zero. And so I'm just writing the masculine version plus a suffix, and I'm reading the feminine version, but it can also often be masculine privileging, like here where the word as a whole cannot be read as such, actorice, doesn't make sense. So I'm reading actor, and then I get a continuation without semantics, which is not a word. So I will tend to ignore this. And all I get is the masculine form plus the information that there is an intention of gender neutrality. And if you take the substitute method, well, it is unprivileged because when I write a ragaz and an asterisk, so it can equally well, it's perfectly symmetric. It could be ragazzo or ragazza. Now, how will I evaluate uh, these methods? It depends on the uh, type of method. So for substitute, I will evaluate coverage. So for how many words can I apply this method? I will also evaluate the number of graphemes mapped to the uh, substitute graphemes. So when I'm uh, taking a ragazzo, ragazza, or claro, clara, and so on. It's always an A and an O, which are mapped to the substitute graphics. So uh, uh, is it always the case that the same graphemes are mapped to the um, substitute grapheme or not? And finally, in Italian, there is also the question of ambiguity with regard to number, because when I write this, it may also be a plural. And this may cause ambiguity in the sentence. Now, this happens only in Italian. In the case of Mark, I can only evaluate coverage. So how many German words can, so by gender, non epicene gender, uh, German words can use this technique. And in the case of join, coverage makes no sense because join can be applied to any word in any language. But what is important is the average backtrack. So how much must I go back to um, use the um, feminine suffix? So actor, for example, I have a backtrack of three, actor, actrice, while in auteur, I have a backtrack of zero. And to evaluate properly, I'm, I will try to um, verify or refute uh, hypotheses. So uh, in each case, I have a strong and a weak hypothesis. The strong hypothesis is the ideal case. So for example, in Italian or in Spanish or Portuguese, the substitute method, I consider that the feminine and masculine uh, versions of the word differ by a single graphic. The weak hypothesis is, well, 
they have a common prefix, but this prefix might be slightly different. Same thing in uh, Mark for the Mark method. Strong hypothesis is masculine and feminine have the same prefix. Weak hypothesis is there may be a slight difference, like an umlaut in German, or like um, a non-zero backtrack. And for join, same thing. Do we have the same stem or not? So this concludes the presentation of the model. And now let's take the individual cases. So starting with the German Binnen E, which was first used uh, in this book in 1981, according to Kotthoff. And then in a Swiss newspaper and uh, in the Tats in 1983. And the same journal Tats is criticizing, so um, Österreich is criticizing the um, Binnen E by calling it the Erektion in text. You can read, read this small um, by Politikerinnen, by Politikerinnen list as Politikerinnen and fragt sich whether the men are blind. And um, here I noticed a coincidence, which uh, is not at all scientific, it's just um, an information um, uh, that uh, the title of this book is Was Sie schon immer über freie Radios wissen wollten, which is mimicking Alles, was Sie schon immer über Sex wissen wollten, which was released uh, 11 years earlier. And uh, in English, you have gender neutral pronouns. I'm not considering them in this talk because they are not graphemic. They, these are lexical methods. And uh, they were introduced in a book called The Joy of Tech, which is mimicking the joy of sex. So this is a coincidence that the books in which these methods appeared for the first time have implicit references to other books with uh, sexual content. Maybe it's a coincidence, maybe not. But it was just a parenthesis. So to return to Bin and E, there are rules. And uh, for example, for dependencies of unknowns, the rule is to use the feminine form, making it even more female privileging because uh, here you still have the capital E, but here you have simply the feminine form. Now, Dam has proposed to use a capital E letter, uh, but this has not been uh, used widely and there have been other uh, marking methods, such as using a punctuational um, a grapheme or using the generous femininum without any mark. And there have also been experimental uses, like putting an underscore uh, after the stem, which doesn't make uh, sense because the stem has nothing to do with the uh, gender. And this is uh, quite interesting using the dynamische unterstrich, which will place randomly the underscore at any position in the world. And this is interesting because it makes out of this method uh, uh, pure intention, the intention to proclaim that we are writing gender neutral. And so it gets rid of all the problems we will encounter and try to evaluate by using random um, positions for this uh, grapheme insertion. So here's the evaluation of the German case. I extracted uh, 4,561 nouns from German dictionary, which were by gender, so in which there was a mutual reference to the female form 
and back from the female to the male form. Uh, so, of course, this corpus is not very rich, but this is all I could extract from the German dictionary. And I found that in 3,672 cases, the method can be applied with a backtrack of zero. So the length of the feminine suffix is zero. In 368 cases, you have here a uh, phoneme which has to be removed. And in 39 cases, you have two phonemes, beamta, beamtin. And this, these cases satisfy the strong hypothesis and then the weak hypothesis with the umlauts and, and considerably less cases, 117 cases like arts, 18 cases where you have both the umlaut and the non-zero uh, female suffix. And one case, Tauber, Teuben, and I have an illustration of ein Tauber umwirbt eine Teuben. So I have here zwei Teubinnen and on this picture. This is a unique case. Um, and then many cases where you can use only lexical methods and also ab about 100 foreign words like coiffeur, coiffeuse, cowboy, cowgirl, where these rules, of course, don't apply. So I get a coverage of 92.4, which is very good for German. Uh, concerning Belarusian, uh, the only information I have is this paper. So uh, gender neutral language and non-binary identities, how can we reform language? And they suggest to use a mark method, uh, like in German, but with insertion either of an underscore or of an asterisk. And it's the German method because here in the case of Akte, Aktrisa, you see here you have the masculine stem and the feminine stem is different because the E is missing. And here the feminine stem is used with the feminine uh, suffix. So it's exactly the German mark method. So you may be wondering what's happening in Russia. So in Russia there, I didn't find any traces of gender neutral language, at least the graphemic one. And if you look into Russian Wikipedia, you will see that uh, gender neutral language is used only by some activists in the feminine or the queer um, communities. Italian. Uh, in Italian, gender neutral language is called linguaggio inclusivo, translation from the French. And I found a feministic pamphlet where they suggest using the art sign, chiocciola in Italian, so snail, for signaling the irreducibility and multiplicity of our differences. So making language more inclusive and fight against uh, masculine violence and gender violence. Now, uh, the allograph used for this punctuational substitute method is the at sign, but in other texts, for example, in this administrative text, I found the use of a punctuational uh, graphene is discouraged. And the one mentioned is the asterisk. And in this official guide, what is encouraged is the join method with a slash. They are laboratory trici, so laboratory laboratrici, portatori portatrici, and so on. To evaluate the um, uh, substitute method, again, I used dictionary and I found that uh, 
81% of nouns, adjectives, and participles satisfy the strong hypothesis. And if we add to this the one satisfying the weak hypothesis only, we get 96% of courage. So what happens in the weak case? Well, we have in the plural, archaichi for the masculine and archaike for the feminine. So it's softened and the H, H is used to soften. And here I have the choice of using either this form or that form. If I use this form, as the H is missing, I am perceptually closer to the masculine form. So it becomes masculine privilege. If I use this form, then it's almost like uh, I'm, if I'm not using gender neutral language, since this happens only with the E and it's necessarily feminine. Okay, so these are the cases and there are a lot of them. Uh, cases where we have only weak coverage and uh, our method is privileging. And then there are another 422 cases which are not covered because they are different. Traductore, traductrice. So it's not a single grapheme which is different and which can be substituted. On the other hand, mapping into the uh, substitution grapheme is quite uniform. In 98%, 98,8%, it's always O and A which are mapped to the substitution grapheme. And the singular and the plural, it's a bit less. In Spanish, uh, sorry for this problem, I will correct it in the next version. Uh, lenguaje igualitario. So here we are talking about uh, equality language, egalitarian language. And our first proposal in 1976 was to use an E instead of O and A. So instead of saying hijos, sons, hijas, daughters, we would use hijes. And uh, this proposal came from this book. And if you look here, the magnifying glass is showing a trivial case of uh, sexism in language where niñada la edad varonil. So the age of man, masculine age, male age. And 2009, there is this um, collective publication about intersexuality in Spanish, which uses a punctuational grapheme, a star. And in uh, Latin America, in Argentina, uh, Lohana Berkins, um, travesti uh, activist, suggests using either the art as a punctuational or the X as a consonantial uh, substitution grapheme. So why the art? Because uh, one of the arguments is that in these languages, O represents um, masculine and A the feminine and the art symbol is an A enclosing, an, uh, no, it's an O in which an A is enclosed. So it's very symbolic. And the X, uh, probably because um, in uh, Latin America, uh, X is used in uh, many um, uh, indigenous languages uh, with different phonetic values. So it's uh, like a alphabetic joker, which can be used in, uh, with many uh, phonetic um, renderings. Evaluation. Uh, I was able to extract many, many more nouns and adjectives than in other languages because uh, Spanish dictionary is well structured. So I got 43,000 non-epicene by gender 
nouns and adjectives, and out of them, 37,000 satisfy a strong hypothesis. So I get an 85,8%. And for the weak hypothesis, I get another 6,000 cases. So what happens here? Uh, you have either empty uh, masculine uh, suffix. So this symbol is substituting a non-existing theme, or you have accents on, on, as, as, which of course uh, are not um, substituted correctly. But, and together, strong and weak hypothesis, I get 99.8% of coverage, which is really extraordinary. And as for mapping, I get a stable mapping of OR for 85.9% of cases, and the rest is mainly the case where the masculine suffix is empty. Now let's switch to Portuguese. Uh, if you look at uh, the thesis of this Brazilian linguist, so it's a thesis on gender identity construction, she says that she used both substitution methods and join methods and also syntactic methods. So she used the whole palette of possible methods. And for substitute methods, she used well, um, no, this one she used a bit less, but she's mentioning them and she's mentioning the X and the at, but she used mainly the join method. In Portugal, uh, the government released a guide on gender neutral um, writing which suggests a punctuational join method with the slash. Just this is uh, often the most conservative method. Now, uh, a question that can be asked is prepositivity. So if I have a feminine and a masculine suffix, which one should I write first? And uh, it's not the answer is not given clearly in the guide, but by looking at the examples, I uh, observed that the choice is uh, a very pragmatic one. So the choice is the one which reduces backtrack. We will see examples. Then this happened in Portugal while in Brazil, in 2012, in a text on women's law, Direito das Mulheres, uh, they take the opposite direction and rather recommend using the um, substitute method with either an X or an uh, at sign, and they explicitly give the symbolics of this at sign. But this is what they recommend, but what is really used in the text is rather the substitute method. So there seems to be some ideological bias here with respect to uh, the um, romance nature of Portuguese language versus the uh, pragmatic and practical aspects of the join method. And evaluation gives good results. I have 87% of uh, nouns and adjectives satisfying the strong hypothesis. And together with the weak hypothesis, I get 95,5%. But what happens in Portuguese, which was not the case in Italian or in Spanish, is that there are some words where the feminine form is shorter than the masculine form. And in this case, uh, the Portuguese will use the join method in a male prepositive way, 
and this will improve, uh, this will reduce the back. And again, uh, concerning mapping of uh, graphemes, we have 90,6% of cases where the graphemes map to the substitution graphemes are O and R. Now let's switch to French. Uh, in French, this um, tendency is called écriture inclusive, so writing in inclusive writing. In 2016, there, have, there has been an official document. So it's from a governmental consulting instance, Au Conseil à l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes. So the uh, equality between uh, women and men. And they recommend a punctuational join method using the lower dot. One year later, a private communication and agency published another manual using exactly the same examples as here, with maybe a 10% of added examples. But the big difference is that they suggest the median point as joinography, as allograph of the joinography. And the other difference is that they expand the use of this grapheme also to entire words. So it's not the model of taking a common stem. There is no common stem. We take two uh, versions, two uh, genders of the same word, of the same lexeme, and we concatenate them using this uh, joiner grapheme. Now, the choice of the allograph. So in, in French, it's um, always a punctuational grapheme. So I consider that uh, it's a generic joining grapheme and we can choose the allograph to represent it. We could use parentheses, which are used uh, for a long time. But the problem with parentheses is that they only work with zero backtrack and people are used to read the whole thing as a, a word. We could use hyphens, but in French there are already quite a few hyphens. Dot is uh, a better choice, but it's already used as full stop and abbreviation mark. And indeed, uh, this proposal has the merit of using a allograph which is unknown to French. So the median dot in French point milieu uh, exists in practically all encodings, but is not used. In, in French, it's used in mathematics, it's used in dictionaries to explicit uh, hyphenation, but not in uh, the language per se. And uh, Haddad is uh, emphasizing this by saying that the middle dot can assert a specific function. So it can be used only with this function. Now, what is the nature of French écriture inclusive? It's not graphème, because if it were graphémic, then in the case of beau, bel, I would use a backtrack of two to write B -E -L -L -E, beau, bel but this is not the case. It's not syllabic either, because if it were syllabic, ke in banquier, ke is a syllable. So I would write banquier, median dot, ke, and this is not correct either. But as you will see, 
French écriture and cuisine with phonographem. So let's take these two examples, Bourbel, Banquier, Banquier. Phonologically, Bo is written B O and Bell, B E L, Bell. So if I take Bo, if I take the phonemic representation of Bo with a backtrack of one, I get a B. So B is common to Bo and Bell. So I write Bo median point L, so the difference between Bo and Bell. Now, this is phonemic. I have a phonemic backtrack of one. How do I represent this? Well, Bo is unchanged and L is represented by L. Same thing, banquier, 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 banquier. So, Banquier, I have again a backtrack of one to get to this year. And the suffix I'm adding is air. And this is exactly what is written here, banquier completely. And then the phonemic, the graphemic representation of air. Now, what are the specificities of écriture and cuisine? Well, one thing which is unique in French uh, gender neutral writing is that the plural is included with a second occurrence of the joining graphene. So ami in the plural will have two median dots. Acteur Eris S. Mise. Now, there is a rule for this. The rule is to process masculine and feminine separately. So we take the, uh, no, sorry, to um, process um, singular and plural separately. So we take singular, apply the transformation, and we take plural and apply the transformation. Now, this rule, of course, is quite artificial and leads to uncertainties and errors. And here is an error I capped it uh, on picture in Grenoble uh, two years ago, the word tout. So what happened here is that the singular of tout is two the so we are we are considering the masculine form t o u t as the stem now if i take this gender neutral form and i use the gender neutral form to get the plural i simply add an s and this could be natural, but it's not the rule. The rule is we take separately the plural and build the gender neutral form inside the plural. And the plural is tous. So the S here is my backtrack. And I write tout with the median dot here between the stem to and the S, which here is considered as the um, masculine suffix. Uh, sorry, uh, which here is considered as the plural. So I'm just adding the T. And you see that the correct form is to place the median dot here, while for the singular it's placed there. And this poor guy, I'm, and I'm saying guy in the gender neutral way. So this poor person, person who wrote this didn't know whether this form or that form is the correct one. So he put three joint graphemes just to be sure. 
But if you look at the stroke weights, if you look at the weight, you will see that this one, which is the incorrect one, is thicker than that one, which happens to be the correct one. Okay. So um, in France, we have um, talent for um, building systems with complicated rules. It's um, Maxime in the Shadox. So the Shadox are the French equivalent of the Mainzel mention, which is the CDF equivalent of the Heinzel mention. And in French, we have this Maxime, why do something simply when it can be done in a complicated way? And this is exactly what they have used for the case of epicene nouns. An epicene noun like functionnaire doesn't change. So normally this shouldn't be a problem, but what happens to dependencies? And the rule says that in the case of epicene nouns, dependencies use a prepositive, uh, the prepositivity of dependencies is alphabetic. So here, territorial, the al, which is feminine, comes before the o, which is masculine, because the string al is ordered before the string au. And normally, and if the same word territorial is used with a non-epicene noun, then the noun is uh, structured in the standard way. So you have first the masculine form and then the feminine one. And the adjective is following, is agreeing with the noun. Now, not only this demands cognitive load, thinking of how will I, um, which, uh, what is the suffix and how can I order the suffixes alphabetically, but it also brings ambiguity. So for example, imagine we have charming territorial agents. Uh, which one among the two adjectives will dominate the noun? If it's territorial, then we have territorial, terri uh, sorry, if it's charmant, then we have a male prepositive case and territorial must follow, must agree, and then we have territorial al, but this is against this rule. And if it's territory, territorial which leads, then we have here territorial O, which agrees with this rule. But then we have here something really atrocious, Charmontets, which makes, makes absolutely no sense. So this is just to show you the ambiguity and uh, you shouldn't think that these rules are given, given clearly and explicitly in the guide. This is what I deduced from two sentences in the guide and two examples. And one of the examples is functionnaire territory. So we are crucially lacking uh, information on the, the rules. Now, a criterion inclusive has been used in literature this novel, Rendezvous pour Amont Egaré, so a meeting for uh, lost uh, lovers, uses this criteria inclusive to hide the gender of the two main characters. So throughout the novel, you, uh, you are unable to identify uh, genders. And uh, this is relatively new, sorry. And this uh, has this exercise has already been done in 1986 by Angareta, which is the first female member of Ulipo. So this is typically an Ulipo challenge 
So in this book, Sphinx, uh, again, you have two characters and throughout the book, you are unable to identify the agenda. And this is a real challenge in French and also a challenge in translation. So here I evaluate the French method. I have 16, uh, these are the 16 most important classes. No, these are all classes in fact. And you see that frequency goes from 70,000 to 10. And I'm evaluating the backtrack. And a backtrack of 0 0,3 means that in average, I will need um, a third of a grapheme when going back to complete my reading. So it's actually a quite good value and it's a bit worse in, uh, in the flow. Okay, so these are the conclusions. And uh, the last language I will treat is Greek. So Greek uses the join method uh, with the slash as uh, join, uh, join a grapheme. And uh, ironically, the slash is called cathetos, which uh, means perpendicular. It's called perpendicular, even though it's slashed. And this is uh, uh, maybe the first book on the uh, gender issue in language. It's called The Gender of Language, 1996 by um, uh, uh, professor of linguistics uh, from Australia. And uh, not only she uses both female and male prepositive terms, but in examples, she gives both. So this shows that in Greek, um, uh, symmetry is kept between female prepositive and male prepositive cases. In 2018, there has been an official guide from the Ministry of Interior and the uh, Secretary of Equality, Equality of Genders, which gives many examples. Unfortunately, uh, it's full of inconsistencies. So in the same page, you see omilitries, uh, um, uh, sorry, here it should be omilites, it's a mistake. Omilites, omil no, no, it's correct. It's first the feminine form and then the masculine S and then a few lines lower, Tes. So it's not clear where to break. It's not clear whether the backtrack is one, two, three, four or whether it's five. And you have uh, even have this, which is really paradoxical you have twice the same, the same uh, suffix, which makes no sense at all. Now, I'm uh, inconsistencies uh, are problematic, not because I'm a perfectionist, but because no clear rules are given, and therefore we need the examples to infer the rules. What is interesting with this document is that although it's official, it's governmental, it mentions subversion, anatreptiki, and awakening of the reader, afipnistika. So uh, it's explicitly said that the, we will mix prepositive and postpositive forms to be subversive and to awaken the reader. And I find this quite sympathetic from an official document. But in reality, it's more difficult because um, in, in Greek, you have the language is very gendered and you have cases so that um, using gender neutral language can be cumbersome. So for example, this is an extreme left um, webpage 
and uh, it says uh, no colleague should ever be alone in front of bosses. And the word colleague has been gender neutralized, but all the dependencies are left in masculine form. So here we are missing three forms. I did an evaluation separately for each case, nominative, genitive, accusative, vocative. And I used uh, adjectives and nouns. Now I found much less nouns because uh, in many cases, the same word is both a noun as an, and an adjective like uh, feelers, friend, friendly, friend. And uh, from this evaluation, I got uh, uh, as you can see, an um, average backtrack, which is quite high. 263, 163, so this is um, the singular and plural, and it's even higher here. So for these, this class of words with suffixes in is, isa, uh, you have a backtrack for 463. While in the guide, it is uh, explicitly said that uh, in no case should we have more than three or four letters in our suffix. So the backtrack should never exceed three or four. And here we reach uh, almost five. Now, um, I just have a few more slides about discussion. So first I compare the three join methods. So remember the join method is used in French, Portuguese and Greek. In French, a uh, grapheme joiner uh, is defined only for this function. This is the specificity of French, but concerning the positivity, uh, it's fixed in most of the cases, masculine prepositivity. And in the case of epicenes, uh, it's based on alphabetic honor. In Portuguese, as well as in Greek, the slash is used as a joiner graphene. In Portuguese, prepositivity seems to be based on minimal backtrack. So I, I say it seems because I only have examples in that guide and I'm inferring this from the examples. While well, in Greek, it's explicitly said in the, in the documentation that prepositivity should be random. And then I have some final comments on the three methods, substitute, mark, and join. So as we have seen, substitute method relies on a very specific feature of, of Romance languages and not all Romance languages, these specific Romance languages. Well, is it, it is possible to obtain both forms with just a single grapheme substitution. And for this single substitution grapheme, there have been many proposals proposal, the vocalic A in Spanish, which adds new morphology rules to the language. The X as some kind of intermediate between um, uh, consonant and punctuation because uh, here it has no phonetic value. So it's used uh, symbolically and punctuational substitution graphene, which the most common are at and the asterisk. The mark method is used in German and is proposed for Belarusian. It has the particularity that the uh, masculine suffix is omitted, which in most of the cases, so in 92% of cases, doesn't change anything because the masculine suffix is void. So this is a specificity of German language. 
And concerning dependencies, there has been this very brave decision to say that dependencies will be always feminine. So here is an alternative which shows what is hidden in this sentence, the Ärztin bekommt ihre Uniform. In uh, using a join method, we would use der, die, Ärztin bekommt seine, ihre Uniform. And finally, concerning the join method, well, this can work in any language. Since we don't even need a common prefix, we just concatenate the masculine and the feminine form in this order or in inverse order. Its efficiency is based on the backtrack. So the more backtrack we have, the more our form gets farther from either the masculine or the feminine form. So the more it gets a new form, which we have to recognize and get used to. And we have the question of prepositivity. Since we use both forms, the question immediately arises, which one should be used first? And in the case of um, French, it's always the masculine, except for this very rare case with epicene nouns, and in Greek, it's random. And speaking about Greek, uh, the backtrack is quite high, and we have an omnipresence of gender information, and therefore the join method can become quickly very cumbersome. And here I have another example, which gives not only uh, many cases in the same sentence, but also the necessary agreements, because this is something I didn't say, but it's, it's obvious when you choose a prepositive order, then all dependencies have to agree with this order. So here, the worker should consider air colleague as air friend, English gender neutral, will become OE, ergatis ergatisa, Na theory tin ton, sinadelfi sa sinadelfo, tu tis os fili o. So we have six words in gender neutral form, of which this one is very weird because it has a back, back track of four. We are going four letters back to put an omicron and one agrees with two, it's the article of the noun, and also five, because this is the pronoun of ergatis, of the worker, and then here, teen agrees with synadelphisa, and also with phili, which is the uh, direct object. And here you have the backtracks and the agreements. So you see, it can become quite cumbersome uh, to, to use gender neutral language in Greek. And uh, join is the only possible method. Now, a last slide to return a bit to uh, computer science. So imagine we have a natural language processing algorithm that has to detect gender neutral forms and go back to the original forms. Is it hard or not? Well, in the case of substitute, if the substitution graphene is punctuational or consonantal, then uh, if the algorithm is aware, aware of this method, it only needs to compare, uh, so uh, replace the substitution graphene by A or O, or other possible choices, and try to locate candidates and then uh, weight them by uh, pertinence. So this should be relatively easy. 
in the case of MAP, the algorithm just uh, will lowercase the E in, in a German binning E and will detect the feminine version. So the algorithm knows immediately what uh, the, the identity of the node. And in the case of join, once again, there is no difficulty because the algorithm will simply omit the joining grapheme and the masculine suffix and uh, take the, the uh, first part, which uh, will be either masculine or feminine, depending on the positivity, uh, plus the information of the intention. So this is my conclusion that from an information theoretical point of view, there is neither added information nor lost information, except perhaps in Italian uh, between plural and singular. The, just, the only information added is the one of the intention of being gender neutral. And by this, I return to this wonderful example of the wandering Bindestrich, uh, Unterstrich, sorry, uh, which is the most extreme method. And finally, the most pure one since it gives the intention and avoids all the problems uh, of uh, morphology and, um, and lexicon. And I conclude the talk with the bibliography, which can be quite useful if you want to um, investigate uh, these issues. So thank you very much.